America and to the republic for which it stands, right? One nation, what is that next part? Under God. So what that is saying here is that God is first. We are a nation under God. Now, not everyone understands that because there's freedom. But in the church, who are we under? Right. So as a nation, even if people don't always do what they're told, it is God's command that we live under his authority. One of the things that God says to do is to live under the authority of the country that you live in. Right? Is that true? I want to show you a quick verse here. Um, let me see. Let me turn to it. I went over this uh, Labor Day, if you guys were here, but it's the same verse right here. It says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior. So, one nation under God. What does indivisible mean? So divisible means divided. So indivisible means not to be de divided, to be united as one. Aren't we supposed to do that as Christian believers too? Yeah? With liberty. Who gives us liberty? Who gives us freedom? Jesus. And justice for all. Who has the final word at the end of the day? Is that God? Okay, so God says, let me take care of the justice. Let me take care of you. It is your duty to live under me. So whenever you say that um, Pledge of Allegiance, you aren't saying that you're putting the nation above God. You're specifically saying one nation under God, undivided, with the liberty that you've given us. Have you guys ever really thought about that, about the pledge that you're giving? You know, there are, a lot of people try to take it out of schools, but whether they do or whether they don't, you need to know why you're pledging and what you're pledging to. You also need to know what's truth and what's not. And what God says is truth is you live under authority and I am the one who tells you how to live. So live under me. Live under the nation. Honor God. Live under your parents. He also says honor your parents. You're supposed to live under authority. This pleases God. So you pray for them. Right? All right. So now that we all kind of understand what it means, the next time you see the flag and you say that, you think about it. Think about what you're pledging to, okay? Let's go ahead and say a word of prayer. God, thank you so much for the freedom that you have given us at a cost, whether it's the lives that were given by the soldiers or even the blood of Jesus Christ. God, you have given us the liberty to live in this country, and we are so thankful for every breath that we give that we can bring you glory. Please help us throughout the rest of this day to just focus on what we need to and also on through the fourth that we can honor the people who have given their lives and also the ones who are still out there fighting. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
bless America. Amen. Amen. We just stand, join us, uh, sing together. How much we are beautiful, uh, living in beautiful country. Oh, beautiful, spacious skies, oh, amber waves of grain, oh, purple mountain majesties. on me and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining Just 
trusting you Lord how we're trusting you my God giving water rain Full of life, I go away. I trust in you, Lord. How we trust in you, my God. There is a fountain, who is a king, victorious warrior, and Lord. shelter my very own blessed redeemer who reigns upon the throne living water living water that you lie on me cleansing me refreshing me will I River full of light, I go where you lead. I will trust in you, Lord, I will trust in you, my God, as my God, Lord. There is a fountain, who is a king? Warrior and Lord of everything, my rock, my shelter, my very home, blessed Redeemer, who reigns upon the throne. There is a fountain, there is a fountain. King, victorious warrior, and Lord of everything, my rock, my shelter, my very home, blessed Redeemer, who reigns upon the throne. Forevermore, amen. amen. You may be said. Oh! <laughs> 
shake The stone was rolled away His perfect love could not be working there we go okay well, we'll skip on that part but Greg said Greg said uh, uh, Dr. Che asked do we need to introduce him and I thought well don't let Greg get up here and introduce me because then I would have to go on to explain why I had the nickname of fizzle one day I'll explain that to you guys but I was uh, I, I was uh, thinking over this sermon that I was going to preach and when Greg had had sent me a text and and uh, and I thought well you know it is fourth of July and and so I started pulling out some sermons that I had done when I passed there at Loop and, and had a sermon series about, you know, the only hope for America is God. You know, and we need God in America. And, and it started bringing that, but God would not let me go that deal. Instead, God put me in this direction here. And the, the title of today's sermon is, Will You Share Jesus? Will you share Jesus? And how long has it been since you shared Jesus? I, I think of that old... Uh, Wolf Brand Chili commercial, you know, and it says, neighbor, when's the last time you've ate a hot steaming bowl of Wolf Brand Chili? And he said, well, that's too long. And that's the same thing I could ask you. When's the last time you shared Jesus? And if you have to pause for a moment, that's too long. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14, verses 14 through 21. We'll stand in the honor of reading God's word this morning. 
Matthew chapter 14, 14 through 21. It says, when he went ashore, he saw a large crowd, and he felt compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this place is desolate and the hour is already late, so send the crowds away that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, well, we only have five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Ordering the people to sit down on the grass, he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food, breaking the loaves, he gave it to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. They picked up what was left over of the broken pieces were twelve baskets full. There were about 5,000 men who ate besides women and children. Father God, we come to you today, and God, we, this is a special time to gather here. God, we do worship you in freedom father we worship you in spirit and truth god you have given to us this freedom to be able to gather here today and we thank you for that but father may we never lose sight of what our call is and that's to share jesus you shared your son the bible says that while we were still sinners you demonstrated your love for us that you sent jesus to die on the cross for us that you loved us so much that you sent your son for us and because of that love, and because we have encountered that love, may we see our responsibility in sharing Jesus to the world. Open the hearts of the people here today. Lord, this is not about me. I must decrease and you must increase. May you be glorified and praised today. May our hearts apply what we hear from you today. In Christ's name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Now, many of us here, we're all we're very well acquainted with this miracle. I mean, if you've been in church for any length of period of time, you have heard sermons preached on this miracle. You have discussed it in Sunday school classes. And we know that just as Matthew had, had given us a footnote, that there was more than just 5,000. We call it the feeding of the 5,000. But yet there's more than 5,000 because that didn't count the women and children. There's possibly anywhere from, from 10 up to 15,000, maybe even up to 20,000 that were there that gathered, that got to eat and partake of this blessing, of this miracle, of these two, uh, of this, this five loaves and two fish. But I want to look at this in a little bit different means, if you will. I want to look at this and what it would apply to us today in the fact of sharing Jesus. When's the last time you shared Jesus? Have you shared Jesus lately? I look at the scripture and I see, in fact, that's what the disciples were doing, right? I mean, Jesus, they gave to Jesus this bread and this fish. He blessed it. He broke it. He multiplied it. And he gave it back to them to give out to those who were sitting there that day. They were, in fact, sharing Jesus. They were sharing his love for them. They were sharing his compassion for them. They were sharing his provision for them. When's the last time you shared Jesus? When's the last time you went to somebody and just shared what God was doing in your life? When's the last time that you shared with those who are hurting what Jesus can do for them? How you, how Jesus can minister to them? When's the last time you shared Jesus? Oftentimes we find it easy to share many other things, do we not? I mean, it's easy to share our vacations with each other. It's easy to share the activities that we enjoy, that we participate in. It's easy to share about sports events or shopping. You know, it's easy to share about our kids and what they're doing and our grandkids. And I can share to you about my grandkid and, and my future coming granddaughter. I love to share about my children. But, you know, we share about those things so readily, so easily. Some of us, we even share more on our personal. We'll share personal things that's going in our lives. We find confidence in people that we can open up ourselves to. And we share about our relationships, about our finances. And we share all these things. And there's nothing wrong with sharing those things. In fact, Paul tells us that we are to bear one another's burdens. Right? That comes in the sharing. But yet, Paul also says we are to carry our own load. Meaning the, the, the call is placed upon us to share Christ. We cannot ride upon the coattails of another. We cannot ride upon the coattails of the church or according to the, the pastor or the deacons or somebody else. We are required to carry our own load. When's the last time 
that you share Jesus? When's the last time you openly talked about your faith in front of others, in front of people you work with, in front of your family, your friends, in front of your kids or your grandkids? Listen to me, church. When's the last time you as a mom and dad or as a grandparent shared Jesus to your children and your grandchildren? What he's done to you, what he's done for you, what he's doing for you, what he means to you, what your faith means to you, where he's leading you. When's the last time you shared Christ? Not only verbally, but demonstratively as well. The Bible says God demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. They need to hear from you, parents. They need to hear from you, grandparents, what Jesus truly means to you. They need to see it lived out of you. They need to see it more in you than they do in the preacher or the Sunday school teacher. They need to see what is your relationship with Christ. You need to share your faith. Maybe there's reasons why we do not openly share our faith. Maybe say, well, I'm waiting for a special event. Maybe when we VBS rolls around, I'll I'll, I'll bring some of my kids and my grandkids to VBS. Maybe whenever we have a revival, I'll invite some of my family, my friends, my coworkers to come. Maybe we're just scared. We're afraid that someone may criticize us. Someone may start treating us different. Somebody may look down their nose and say, oh, you are one of those. When's the last time you share Jesus? Maybe we're afraid that our family and friends will forsake us. And that might be possibly true. But Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. When's the last time you share Jesus with those who are lost? With those who are hurting? With the poor? With those who are in need? Or how about this? When's the last time you share Jesus with other brothers and sisters in Christ? When's the last time someone come up and shared Jesus with you? You see, folks, we need Jesus shared with us just as much as the lost needs Jesus shared with them. We need Jesus shared with us just as much as the world needs Jesus shared with them. We need someone to come along side of us at times, to put a loving arm around us, to encourage us, to share with us what God is doing in their life, to give us that encouragement that we need, to help us to press on toward the mark. We're the high calling of God. We need what, what Paul had, a Barnabas. We need encouragers today. We need people who are willing to open their eyes and see that the harvest is full, but the laborers are few. We need people to look and see that Christian brothers and sisters are, are struggling. And then need people to come alongside them and love on them and encourage them. We need more people to share Jesus. We need more people to share Jesus with the world and with each other. I don't know about you, but I get a spiritual boost at times when somebody comes up to me and begins to share with me what Christ has been doing in their life. Where God is leading in their life. We need to be sharing Jesus. In order to do that, we've got to have compassion just like Christ did upon the people. We have to have a passionate desire that out of that love and compassion that we seek ways to minister and to share Christ. It starts very plainly with just the compassion that Christ demonstrated upon the people there. In verse 14 it says, When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and he felt compassion for them. And notice what he did. He began to heal their sick. He was moved out of his compassion, out of his love for them. He looked over the crowd and instead of judging them, which he had every right to do, instead of calling them out for their sin, his heart broke with compassion and he began ministering to them. He wanted these people to know that he truly loved them. And in doing so, he looked and seen their physical need. He looked and seen the need for healing And he began to demonstrate his love for them by healing their sick. Now don't get me wrong. He wanted to minister to their spiritual need. He's seen their spiritual need. But he's willing first to minister to the physical knowing that soon that would lead to the spiritual. 
by ministering first to the physical, he was showing them his heart, his love, his compassion. The love that he had for them did, was not based upon how much they loved him. It was how much he truly loved them. See, there were people that gathered today that were just there for their selfishness, their own. They wanted to, to perhaps see a miracle, see something performed. They were there to get what they wanted, maybe even if it was for physical healing themselves. They were there for themselves. But even for that reason, Jesus still showered love and compassion upon these people. Some there, including his disciples, had what we call an, an eros love, a self-giving, a self-love for themselves. Some there had a filial love, which was a brotherly love. But the love that Christ demonstrated that day, the love that Christ poured on those, on those people that day is what we reference to as an agape love. A self-sacrificial love. A love that goes beyond borders, holds no boundaries, has no limits and no conditions upon it. Folks, we cannot minister effectively without an agape love. Amen? And let me tell you, you and I cannot produce that kind of love. Only by the work of the indwelling spirit within our lives can we produce the love that God has for us. We need a brotherly love, but we need the agape love that will help us reach and look beyond faults and failures and pour out love as Jesus did upon the multitude that gathered there that day. If we're going to effectively share Christ, we have to do so out of that kind of love, out of that kind of compassion. We have to have a compassion for those who are hurting, those who are in need, those who are in need of a spiritual healing. And in order to do that, we have to be aware of our surroundings, do we not? And the only way we can be aware of our surroundings is that we have to open our eyes and see. The Bible says that when he saw, his heart was moved with compassion. We need our eyes open, do we not? We need to see all that's going around us. We need to see all the opportunities that God places for us. We don't need to pray to God, I, I pray that you open up a door opportunity for me today. No, we need to say, God, open my eyes to see the many opportunities that you lay before me that I may share your love, that I may share Jesus with those who are out there in the world. But sadly, we are often plagued with what I call spiritual cataracts. Some of you may know what a cataract is and what it, how it distorts your vision. Some of you may know somebody who had a cataract and had it removed. I remember my grandmother and she had, had a cataract and she began to just assume that she was going to have to forever look and see this way. Like she, she was going to always have this distorted view. Never be able to see things clearly anymore. And I remember she went to the doctor and I said, no, we can remove those cataracts off your eyes. And I remember when she had them removed, how things just opened up. And she began to see things that she had never seen them before. She began to see them as they were, she had seen them for the first time all over again. But after a couple of years, she began having trouble seeing again. And so she went back to the doctor, asking, what's wrong? Am I getting another cataract or, or what's happening? Am I losing my sight? And, and the doctor and said, well, in some cases, with some people who's had a cataract removed, they began to, years later, have a film that begins to grow over their eyes. So what we need to do to you is remove that film that's covered over your eye. And they did. And when they did, she began to see as if she saw for the first time again. Her eyesight was restored. Her vision had been made whole again. We can often apply that to us, can we not? When we first were saved, when we came to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, our eyes were made open. The, the, the spiritual blindness had been removed. We began to see, see the need out there. We began to see the hearts of the people. We began to have a love and passion for Christ that we wanted to share with anybody that we came in contact with. But years go by and film begins to grow over our eyes and we no longer see the people out there as we used to see them. We don't see those who are lost, those who are hurting, those who are needing. Just like my grandmother, we've had some kind of film grown over our eyes and we need it removed. We are in need of spiritual eye surgery today. And you can see the evidence even in the lives of the disciples here. 
when they told Jesus, you know, this place is desolate and the hour is already late. So you send the crowds away that they may go into the village and buy food for themselves. They could not see what Christ was seeing. Their vision was distorted. They could not see the true need that was there today. Not only was it from physical hunger, but from spiritual hunger as well. They could not see it. So Jesus begins to do spiritual eye surgery when he tells them they do not need to go away. And what does he tell them? He says, you give them something to eat. See, Jesus knew the need. He's seen the need. He's seen that these people were not only sick in need of physical healing. He's seen that these people were not only hungry in need of physical food, but there's a spiritual need that they needed. And he was the only one who could truly fulfill that need. And he does something remarkable when he gives a statement to the disciples. When he tells them, you give them something, he's taking that film off their eyes in order that they may see as he sees. Disciples are probably thinking, wait a second, you, you want me to feed this bunch? Uh, you calling me to go do, isn't that what you're here for? Isn't that what we put you in this position for? Isn't that what we hired you for? Isn't that your calling? Isn't that your, your, your burden upon you? Isn't that what God put you here for? I mean, not me. I, I could never do something like that. That's, that's just not me. I mean, after all, you're better with words than I am. Wouldn't you be better to send them away? Wouldn't you be better to take care of it? But Jesus wanted his disciples to know that the need of not only meeting the, the physical needs of the people, but the spiritual needs was, a, was just as much their responsibility as it was his. He wants us to know, us who call ourselves a child of God, us who call ourselves a believer, that it's our job to feed them, to give them something to eat. I can imagine the disciples then said, okay, let me start seeing what's out there. I don't know how we're going to do it. And in John's gospel, in, in, where he records the same incident, Jesus, after he tells them, you give them something to eat, he then turns and directs the question to Philip. He says, where shall we buy the bread that these may eat? Pushing further that you do something. Philip, like a good treasury, financial treasury of the church, you know, he comes around and says, Lord, I'm sorry, but the giving has been down here lately. Not everybody's been giving like they should. I mean, all we have in the treasury is, is 200 denarii, which is $50. You know, according to our, our money, it's $50. We don't have enough to feed these people. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous. $50, we ain't buy enough bread to even feed half of them. You see, I believe Jesus asked Philip this question. He wanted Philip to open his eyes. To see, it wasn't just the physical need for bread, but the spiritual need for the heavenly bread. And the heavenly bread would be Jesus himself. He wanted Philip to recognize that Jesus was what they needed. It didn't matter how much they had in the treasury. Everything they needed and could ever want stood right there in their presence. He wanted Philip to see that because they had Christ with them, they truly had the ability to meet the needs of the people. Many times, folks, we become so focused in trying to reach out and meet the needs of people that they become overwhelming, do they not? I imagine the disciples felt overwhelmed that day. How are we truly going to be able to meet these needs? We begin so focused on the, the physical needs that we tend to overlook the spiritual needs. We become overwhelmed. We become realized there's no way we can do this. There's no way we are able to meet these needs. We begin to be like the disciples. The disciples said, Lord, all we have here is five loaves and two fish. They were basically saying, Lord, I don't know what good is it. You know, this is all we have. This little bitty old, old uh, lunch, you know, it's just like a little Oscar Mayer Lunchable in a vast group of so many. How is this going to feed them? What they were hoping that somehow Jesus said, okay, you're right. You know, this is all we got. Okay, you know, let's send them away. But no. Jesus wanted them to understand truly how little is much when God is in it. We easily follow the same path of the disciples, do we not? We begin to look at ourselves in the same light. We begin to think of ourselves, well, we're so small in, in the need of something that appears to be so great. 
We're so inept of being able to truly get out there and do what God wants us to do. We feel so powerless. Surely there has to be another way. Surely there has to be another person. Surely there's somebody better than me. And we begin to take upon ourselves a getting like attitude, thinking we're so weak and small. But God looks us at, at us as the same way he looked at Gideon when he said, I am with you, you mighty man of valor. When the disciples felt that there was nothing they could do, this is all they had, Jesus simply told them, bring it here to me. Give it here to me. Jesus was warning his disciples to know that they could trust him. That he could take that which seemed impossible and make it possible. He wanted them to put into practice what Paul lived, what Paul taught, that certainly I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. No matter how small you may feel, no matter how insignificant you think you are, no matter how uh, of, of your abilities or capabilities you think you, ha you do not have, if you're willingly just put it in Christ's hands, if you willingly just give it to him, he can take what little you have and he can multiply it. And he can use it to reach many people. But you have to be willing to bring it to him. You have to be willing to share it with him. Just like that little boy. That little boy could have said, and said, no, that's mine. My mama made that for me. Everybody knew where they were coming to. Everybody should have been prepared. That's my meal. But no. See, the boy was moved with compassion as well. And he gave his lunch to Jesus. Something that seemed so small, so insignificant, but yet when it became into Christ's hands, it fed so many. That's what God wants from you. See, God doesn't want you to say, well, let, let me be in church. Let me go to church for this amount of period of time. Then I'll start stepping in and I'll start sharing Jesus more. Let me get a little more Bible knowledge. Let me get a little more, you know, uh, 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 a little more uh, abilities growing, you know. Let, let me work on this area and that area. Let, let me. And God says, no. Just bring yourself to me as you are. As little as you think it is. And notice what? I can do with it. And then notice what Jesus does. In verse 19, he ordered the people to set down the grass. He took the five loaves and two fish, and he looked up toward heaven, and he blessed the food, and breaking the loaves, then notice what he did. He gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave it to the crowd. I don't know if you ever noticed that. I noticed it probably more when I used to pastor church of, of the deal of, of how people always think, well, this is your job. This is, this is, is what you're called to do. Notice what Jesus did. See, Jesus gave them a command earlier. He said, you feed them. And that even though he said, you bring the food here to me, he did not know where did he take away from the command he'd given them earlier. The Bible says he gave it back to the disciples. And the disciples gave it to the crowd. Jesus didn't take away the command that he placed upon them earlier. Jesus didn't take away their call, nor does Jesus take away our call. The Bible tells us in, in what Paul writes in Ephesians 4.11, he said, now these are gifts that Christ gave to the church. What gifts are these? He gave the, these are gifts to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and the teachers. What's their role? What's their job? Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work for the building up the church, the body of Christ. See, folks, we got to transition from being just fans of Christ to truly being followers of Christ. While we bear one another's burdens, but we are required to carry our own load. God's desire, just as Jesus' desire, wasn't to put it just on one or two disciples to take care of feeding the crowd, but yet he placed upon all there, as he does with us. He's given us all the ability to meet not only the physical needs, but the spiritual needs as well. When Jesus gave it back to them, he put the ball back in their court. He was teaching them, yes, you can do this that I require of you. You can truly be a follower of me. You too can truly be a follower of Christ. Just like Jesus gave them what they needed in order that they may meet the needs of the people of their day, Jesus gives to you 
what you need. He gives you your abilities. He gives you your capabilities to reach out and to meet the needs of others. You have to be willing to share. Jesus says, the word of the scripture says, Paul writes to, I mean, uh, Matthew writes to them, and once they all ate of the food, they were satisfied. Jesus didn't leave them hungering and still wanting for more. But Jesus satisfied their hunger. And Jesus is able to satisfy their spiritual hunger as well. Jesus fed them. He filled them up. And as they were filled, so were the disciples being filled as well too. When you are doing the will of the Father, you're going to be fed as well as you are doing the one who's doing the feeding. You'll be fed and you'll be satisfied. And you're going to have plenty to go around. Because notice what the Bible says, they picked up what was left over, 12 full baskets. In John's gospel, uh, John writes that, that the leftover fragments were to be gathered up so that nothing would be lost, nothing would be wasted. Jesus gives you an abundance. But his desire is that none of it go to waste. None of it is lost. He wants you to use your talents and your abilities. He wants you to use the abundance that he has given you. All for him and for his glory. Jesus had plenty of leftovers to go around, did he not? Some of us, you may not like leftovers, but can I tell you this much? The leftovers of Christ are far better than the leftovers of this world. When we learn to shift our focus from what we need and always focusing on our needs and begin to look to the needs of others, we begin to see that indeed God has given us the ability to meet the demand. When's the last time you shared Christ? When's the last time you shared Jesus? Sharing Jesus is more than just sharing salvation, while salvation is important. And we need to go out and share the gospel message, but we also need people to come alongside of us and share Jesus with us as well. We need somebody to come alongside of us and encourage us. Somebody to come along and say, hey, I'm praying for you. Somebody to lift us up in prayer. Somebody just to share Jesus with us. The world needs Jesus, yes. But so do you and I. We need Jesus. When's the last time someone has shared Jesus with you? Perhaps you're here today and you need Christ shared with you. All you have to do is come to this altar. Come to this altar. Say, Christ, I need you. I need you. Or perhaps you need to be busy sharing Christ with others. Maybe you know someone who is here today who is, who is lost and they need Christ shared with them. Maybe you know somebody who is hurting. Maybe you know another Christian brother or sister who is ready to throw in the towel, who's ready to give up and walk away. Maybe today you need to go to them and you need to share Jesus with them. No matter how small or insignificant you may feel like you are, truly little is much when God is in it. Jesus is telling you today as he told his disciples. You go out and feed them. You go out and share Jesus. My invitation to you today as the pianist comes, Dr. Che comes to lead the invitation, will you share Jesus? Will you share Jesus today? Father God, I come to you today and God, I ask, Father, that you open the hearts of the people today to respond to this invitational call that you desire for us to share your love to share your grace father not only do we need to share it with those who are lost but father we as christians need brothers and sisters to come alongside of us to share christ with us as well and may we look at those who are hurting and those who are in need and may we walk up to them today and share jesus We just stand and we sing together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. In Christ alone, my hope is found. Is it my my strength, my song, His cornerstone? 
this holy ground Come to the fiercest drought and storm What I shall blow, why that the peace When fears I steal, when striving cease My comforter, my all in all In the love of Christ I stand In Christ alone to confess for his heart and helpless pain this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the one he came to save till on the cross let Jesus die the wrath of God was satisfied for sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live Our Heavenly Father, our Lord and our Master we just come to you again just thanking you so much for letting us be in your house Father, we just want to thank you for the words that Brother James has brought to us Father and help us to, uh, to apply it. And Father, I just ask for your forgiveness for not sitting at, at your feet more and for not telling people more about you, Father. Father, I just come to you just asking that you'll just bless this gift and the giver, Father, and just go with us. And if there's one here that needs to make a decision, Father, I just ask that they make it before it's too late. Go with us now, Father, through the rest of this day. Forgive us of our sins. Ask these and all of the blessings for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Great, great job, Rhonda. Thank you, James. It was great to have him, right? So, uh, God bless us. God bless America. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. But just remind, where is the blessing comes from? Jesus Christ. Would you stand and join your hand together and sing together? There is a fountain. Jesus Christ, He is our King. There is a fountain who is a King, victorious warrior and Lord of everything. My rock, my shelter, my very Bless you. Have a wonderful, blessed day. 